right, so we'll go ahead and call the select board meeting for Wednesday, December 2nd, 2020 to order. And I just have to notify everybody that this meeting is being recorded and that all votes will be taken by roll call vote. And in attendance from the select board, we have Jane Nevin Smith, John Moskevitz, myself, David Phil, Joyce Chunglo, and Christian Stanley. And all right, we'll get started. First order of business is the consent agenda. We have minutes from March 25th, 2020. We have warrants PR2108, PR2110, AP2120, AP2120S, AP2121, AP2121S, AP2122, AP2122S, AP2123, AP2123S, and from the Historical Commission, we have a resignation of Carolyn Holstein. And that's it for today. So moved. Second. Okay, motion by Joyce, second by Jane. Any discussion on those topics? Jennifer? Uh, roll call vote, Phil? Yes. Chungalu? Yes. Nevin Smith? Yes. Wiskevitz? Yes. Stanley? Yes. Okay. Thank you. And uh, public comments, before I get into that, I'll let Jane start off with uh, an announcement about the uh, Council on Aging Roast Beef Dinner, and she's going to share a picture with us. I've lost it. Wait a minute. Uh -oh. All right. <laughs> the Senior Center is having a fundraise um, roast beef dinner, fundraising roast beef dinner. And now we, if I can get back here, I can share this. It will be on Sunday, the 13th of December. Can you see that? Never no. mind. Yeah. I don't need to show it. Um, Sunday, the 13th of December, it's a to-go, roast beef to-go. Uh, 16 ounces of roast beef, mashed potatoes, green beans, salad. It's a fundraiser for the friends. It's $25 and pickup is between three and four at the senior center. Tickets need to be purchased by Monday the 7th at four o'clock when we close. Okay. All right, so any other, anybody else here for public comments? If you are, turn on your camera or make yourself known. Uh, well, one, one announcement I'll make now, while we probably have an audience on TV, is uh, French Street is going up for auction December 19th at noon. Uh, that's 6th French Street, which is a property owned by the town currently under tax title foreclosure. So if you're uh, interested in buying some waterfront property, so to speak, in North Hadley, <laughs> So uh, you can check uh, Douglas Auctioneers uh, and uh, I'm sure Linda might have something to say about it later on in the evening. So I just wanted to put that out there. But any other public comments, last chance? Do you want me to do our my, my condolences now at this point or you wanna wait till the end? Uh, we can wait till the end if you want. Okay. Uh, uh, all right, let's move on to Town Administrator Report. Carolyn, do you want to give us a quick update of what you have? Sure. I just want to give you some updates about some staff changes and retirements that you may know about, but I haven't really officially presented them. Sharon Gifford will be retiring on January 22nd. Um, she has been working for the Town of Hadley's Department of Public Works for 12 years. And Jenny Vanassi, the Director of Parks and Recreation, has been offered a position in Lenox, Mass and her last day will be December 18, 2020. Deborah uh, Radway from HR and myself will be meeting with each uh, department to find out what their needs are and to look at um, reviewing the job description and, and any other changes that might be needed and then move forward to post those positions. All the DP workers, all the DPW workers are back negative, which is really good news. Um, unfortunately, we're trying to uh, 
uh, hire a labor. There was still one more employee that needed to be replaced. And um, uh, the interviews did not bring forth a real strong candidate, so they are going to post that, that position again. And as David mentioned, uh, French Street is scheduled for auction and North Hadley Village Hall, you will be discussing um, at the December 16th Select Board meeting in executive session. So the volunteer recognition, Jane, I'm gonna talk about that on Friday that uh, Haley and Jane invited me to, to help uh, recognize the volunteers that help out at the senior center, uh, curbside cocoa and cookies. So that's going to be from 1230 to 2, yep. and um, it's going to be nice to be back in my stomping grounds at a senior center. And uh, I, I know they have some special thanks uh, that they've mentioned for uh, just saying thank you to police and fire. And uh, yes, I did. Mother's Club of Hadley. I'm on a meet. As well as the Friends of the COA who've been um, doing so much fundraising for them. And Jane talked about the roast beef dinner. Uh, there is a new initiative from the Baker Polito Recovery, they're from their recovery plan for small businesses. And that is, uh, that won't involve money, but it will involve, um, it's instead there's a lead agency such as Pioneer Valley Planning Commission that you use their technical assist assistance to prioritize some actions and strategies to help small businesses recover from the COVID impact. Uh, we did get a report from the Regional Small Business Grant. If you remember that, Valley Community Development uh, was doing that. And 18, there were 18 applicants. 15 are still in progress, which probably means, because they're doing it online, it probably means they don't fit the criteria. There, it was kind of narrow, the criteria. So there's disappointment about that. But um, they're, they're trying to analyze that now why more businesses didn't participate. And so the Mass Municipal Association, their annual meeting and trade show that happens every year. Um, the good news is it's very cheap this year. Um, this, the challenge is it's going to be Zoom. So if any of you have attended before, um, it's a, it was normally a two to three day conference at the um, Heinz Center in Boston. It was a pretty amazing event with workshops. We're doing it all online. So instead of over $300, it's gonna be $85 a person, which certainly will make it more affordable for more people to attend. So um, I did put a link to register, but if you have any trouble with that, uh, Jennifer has offered to help you register if you'd like to. And it's only two days instead of, it was Thursday, Friday, and part of Saturday, I think, or Thursday night, Friday, and Saturday. Yeah, it's now just Thursday and Friday. Um, so speaking of MMA, I did want to just take this opportunity. Um, as you know, there's an association called um, Small Town Administrators um, of Massachusetts. And David Nixon has been very involved with um, this group for many years. And um, at their uh, most recent meeting, um, David was recognized by the chair, Andrea, and noting that Nixon not only served the communities he worked in throughout his career, but also served as a former leader of STAM. He was uh, um, given a professional certification and with it came a pin. I understand, David, you might be able to explain that more. But I just, in case you haven't read the Beacon um, and for the public, I just wanted to quote a little bit from that um, event. And um, it said, I think we all agree that David has been an invaluable resource due to his wealth of knowledge and his unwavering support of his peers and the small team, small town administrators, administ administrators of Massachusetts, said Lamas, the town administrator in Northfield. He has always been a reliable colleague who we will sorely miss for his timeless advice and my wit. And I called Denise Baker to get more information about that certification. And what she told me is, um, not many administra administrators meet that standard, that criteria. There's, um, and David, you may even want to, I don't, I put you on the spot right now, but um, there's a lot of uh, engagement and go attending meetings and being in a leadership position. And um, so I just wanted to make sure that you knew that and the public knew that, that that was a very um, prestigious award to get. So I wanted to let you know about that. And that's it. Mm. Congratulations, David Nixon. Thank you all. Thank you very much for those kind words, Carolyn. I appreciate it. Okay. 
and that's I, that's all I have. Okay. Um, I think if we are able to, I'm guessing that uh, Paul and Dr. McKenzie are probably here for the uh, Middle Street Dragway request. Is that uh, Paul and yes. okay. So, yeah, David. Yeah, Paul's here too. Yep, there he is. Anne, can you also, um, when you get done with that driveway, which is kind of important but not important, uh, can you just give us a little update on the schools for us that don't have children in the school? And I know we get your weekly announcements, but uh, just for the general public that doesn't. Sure, I'm happy to. And I'm happy to turn the driveway over to Paul. <laughs> <laughs> all right so just uh so everyone has the background basically this is uh 113 middle street i believe and uh we've been talking about this for a little while we had sent it over to the school committee to get their input on the topic uh before we made a decision so paul uh what did you guys come up with yeah first off just thanks for asking we really appreciate your you, you all being thoughtful like that we did send it to our uh, attorney to get some feedback. And then also I, I went out this weekend and just walked around and had the maps. And we, I also asked our designer, as obviously, as you know, we're redoing the athletic fields. And if you haven't been out to look at it, the, the path around it is complete and the grass is growing. So you can't really walk on it, but it looks beautiful. Um, so the, our attorney had two points. One, I think you, your attorney, the town's attorney made, you know, this idea of being conscious of the precedent we set, you all set. I don't see that as a school committee decision. That's obviously a select board decision, so I won't really touch on that. The other concern that the our attorney brought up was that if we authorize this, are we precluding future use of some of that area, the, the school property that would be sort of, or is frankly now currently encumbered by that uh, driveway? So. That's a possibility. Frankly, it's a low risk, right? So when we planned out the athletic fields, we have this path, this asphalt path that goes around. The area up to there, up by the, the 113 property is complete. We do not have any plans for future use of that land. It's really, we're just talking a handful of feet and we designed the walkway to avoid the current area and the proposed area. So <clears throat> from our, from my perspective, from a, a school, we we view, we're using that area as we plan. There's currently no uh, problems with the current, and I, as far as I can tell from the map, the proposed use, we might want to put something down just to note on our walkway. You know, not for driving. Please stay off, just so that the the driveway doesn't encroach onto that walkway. Um, but Frankly, I, I see that as a small risk. We could put a sign up and just note that. Um, we Not just for this 113 property, we don't want anybody driving there. Just as a note for you all too, there's a gate though that uh, we've put up uh, way uh, so to preclude people from doing just that thing, from driving on that walkway that in, into our area. As an aside, I've contacted some of the local folks at uh, Snowmobile, because I know that's a, an important route that people use to go to Cumbies there to fill up with gas. It's a black gate. I don't want people flying by at night and you know being surprised that that's there. So I'm working with the local snowmobilers and we're a meeting tomorrow actually with our designer about putting some reflective tape or some way to, to, to make sure a snowmobiler at night will, will see it. But back to the, the price property, I really don't see a significant risk from a school perspective. Hey, Paul, on that gate, um, when you talk to snowmobilers, I, I hope they're going to recommend, or you guys going to recommend some kind of signage that there is a gate there because I mean, somebody's going to get killed on a snowmobile going through there in the winter time. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And I mean, my recommendation, we haven't had a chance to talk to this Annie is that we just open it up for the winter. I'm not worried about people driving down. It, but there's still the poles up, so a sign and some reflective tape. Yeah, I agree. I'm yeah. concerned about that as well. I agree. Okay. And uh, Bill Dwyer had a some advice on um, if, if we were to allow uh, 
this usage as is proposed that we would phrase it in a certain way. What did you say it was like a like a, a license or not not a lease, but a, what was the term you used for a short term? That's correct. I suggested uh, what's known as a license, which is something less than an easement and certainly less than a grant of title. Uh, it is just uh, bare permission to let the, um, let the driveway remain on town land uh, for the time being. Um, and it could be for a term of years. Uh, when I write up things like this, I frequently say something uh, that, but, such as the, uh, the license will terminate when the driveway is re next reconstructed. And at that point, it will be moved onto the property. Um, is, that's, that called, is that called like an easement at will? Uh, nope. It's to the technical term is license Okay. It, to distinguish it from a lease or an easement. It is a, a that's why I call it bare permission. It, it's yes, you may do this. Um, but it is not a property right really. Uh, and I, I have to preface or I have to add to all of this and disclaimer that I am not giving legal advice. You have very competent town council. Uh, but if you want to ask them about something along those lines, also, this is not a recommendation from the planning board. This is just my experience as a real estate lawyer for a few years. Yeah. Much, muchly appreciated, Bill. Thank you. So if I may add just a statement on behalf of the planning board, uh, we have no vested interest in whatever decision you may make, and we are not advocating for anything we just realized that the applicant cannot file an application until they get this squared away because we obviously cannot give him permission to remain on town property. So they have to work out their permissions before they come in and file something with us because we have no interest in spending time considering a plan that that is based on a premise that is unattainable. So, hey, hey Bill, the, uh, the other 75 or 100 driveways that go across town property on West Street and Middle Street, we don't have anything like that for any of them right now anyway, do we? No, uh, I, I believe not because all of those are permitted in some way. They have a driveway permit. <clears throat> or predate the need for a driveway permit. The issue here is not that they are crossing the tree belt to get to uh, their, the, their front property line. The issue here is that the entire driveway is located on, uh, on other town-owned property. So not only do they go through the tree belt, but they also go down along the opening the the piece of the athletic fields that comes out to middle street so they're they're on two kinds of town property and one crossing the tree belt might be covered by a driveway permit um actually being on other town-owned property requires something more so if we were to grant a license that would be in effect until, you know, as you mentioned, the driveway was reconstructed. Would that be sufficient for the planning board to act on this or do, do, do you need something longer term than that? No, I think that would be, uh, that would be fine for us. Uh, but again, I defer to town council if, uh, if they feel that, uh, that we shouldn't proceed without something more longer term, then so be it. Um, I haven't really thought that part of it through. Uh, I think a purely revocable license, something revocable at will, would not be enough for us to, uh, would not be enough to support the application, but uh, something for a more definite term would. Is there not enough property there? Um, this is what I'm all confused about, why they need to park on town owned land is there not there enough property on their property for this parking spaces 
I won't speak for them. I will only speak from having heard the arguments or the uh, suggestions many times. Uh, yeah. Apparently, there are some mature trees in the tree belt. And if the driveway to, were to be relocated more centrally to come onto the property, it would probably disrupt the root system of one or more mature trees. The other thing that I've heard is they're actually moving the parking to in front of their house and it would not be on town property. They would just use the driveway on town property. So then I, it sounds like if town council is okay with it, a license, you know, that's good for as long until the driveway is reconstructed would uh, basically accomplish what we need to accomplish and what they're trying to accomplish. Uh, because, you know, a new driveway install is good for, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50 years normally. So it would be a fairly long-term license. Um, I don't know. So what's the, what's the thinking of the rest of the board here? And then we'll need some sort of motion. I'm just looking back here on the searching back to the meetings to get the old, the drawing, but looking at that, it looks like their driveway would be going to a parking area on their property. So it'd be really similar to, you know, what a lot of us that live on West Street and Middle Street have, except in this case, that driveway would be on the other side of the sidewalk, you know, away from the street. So um, I don't know, we, I guess we could always, if, if we want to make a motion about this, um, I, I don't mind making a motion. I just don't know if we want to include in that motion um, doing something, saying something in the motion to have legal review um, prior to agreeing to it. I don't know if we've done any legal review up to this point. The um, Carolyn can correct me if I'm mistaken here, but it sounded like the town council was generally against this idea uh, you know, any sort of license or usage of, of town property based on the precedence that it would set, but that would, that was their opinion. Um, and it sounded like the school commit, the school's attorneys were, had a similar, uh, opinion, but, um, like the Paul said, it's not really going to interfere with anything the school's needing or trying to do. The town has also set precedent for driving across town property with B1 because there's no access to their parking except through the town property. And we didn't do anything with them just for that reason also, yeah. So it's like, use it and their parking's on, Jane, their, their parking's on their property anyway. I, I keep looking at the maps and I, the driveway that's there is already existing. They just want, a place to park on their own property from that access. So that that little bit, which according to that map, really isn't very much on the school property. And I don't even know if it's school property or our property because the drain line goes through there. And I, I think, think that's that's right. I was told a little bit of it is school property. Just that if you look at that map, there's a grayed out existing yeah. driveway area. The gray yeah. out is apparently school property, but it's, as you said, John, it's a very small piece. It's essentially already in driveway use as far as I can tell and has yeah. been for a long time. Yeah. That's been a through way to the softball field forever. Yeah. Yeah. It's been, it, you know, since Phil Reed was there, it's been used the same for 50 years or more since I can. Yeah. Yeah. All right. We'll make a motion that we um, let this project go forward with um, a license agreement prepared by town attorney. Do you, want, do you want to add a time period where that license would terminate? Uh, Bill, do we need to add a time period on that or is it just a general license acceptable for the planning board? Um, that's up to you. We would we would be, yeah. If you if they have permission to you continue to use that driveway, then we have a basis for proceeding. Okay. Uh, I don't think we need a a time limit. I only pass that along because that's how I've handled 
it's not uncommon to have a driveway cross a property line. So mm -hmm. that's how I've handled it in the past in my practice. That's the only reason I mention it. I'm not suggesting that as a requirement for proceeding with the planning board. Okay. So I yeah. just that my only I, I'm, I'm kind of using this as a discussion period, but I think we should set some, some kind of precedent um, with this and process that we can treat similarly because like V1, for example, um, you know, we really don't have any control over that situation, it seems like. So what kind of checks can we put in place where, um, you know, we can have some kind of say and, and those kind of things. And although this is a smaller magnitude, it does set a precedent. So I, that's why I'm afraid to make a motion or vote on a motion is because I feel like we need a little bit more thought about how we want to treat situations like this. Well, as I think opposed to just think, making a decision. I think if you add in there that we will take each consideration as a separate uh, opinion, um, that this is not going to set precedent that we will, uh, case by case, uh, we will make a determination. Bill, yeah, um, as far true. as the license goes, what, uh, what's required to revoke the license typically? Do we need to give a certain amount of notice? Let's just say the school had a project that they were gonna start there next year. What, what would be needed in order to tell them that they need to vacate the town property basically? I, I think that's something you'd want to build into the terms of the license. <clears throat> so if you're going to make it a revocable license, uh, you would specify the conditions under which you could revoke it. Um, so that's, yeah, that's basic contract language. Um, so you, you, you just decide how, how generous or tight you want to be in granting permission. Okay. So we have a motion by Jane, a second by Joyce. Any other discussion? Krishna, did you want to add anything to that? Or is there, I mean. I would, the only thing I would add is pending the legal document we produce, reviewing that and then um, you know, I'm just not a lawyer. Whenever I need legal advice, I go to my lawyer, he produces something and then I review it. So it's like, uh, well, think, that's kind of the way Jane, I like to do it uh, more than trying to just imagine how it should be. But I think Jane covered that Christian when she said with the motion that we would, it would pending legal review. Okay. Yeah. As long as we have that in there, I'm, I'm good with that. And, yeah. and, and for this case, I, I totally am for doing it just for the record. It's not about that. It's more about the precedent and what we do moving forward. Correct. I'm definitely for, you know, the guy's been using a driveway since he bought the place. And as I said, it's been used for this for 50 years. It's, it's a case by case basis, but this little chunk of land that he, he's still going to use to, to access his parking area now is, is what's in question, which is pretty minimal. Yeah. So, Car Carolyn, after this comes back from town council, could you just bring it back in front of the select board for final approval, just to make sure that we're all on the same page? Absolutely. And I think what might be help, what might be helpful, Bill, is maybe if we, when we called Jeff um, Lake to talk, to include you in that phone call. Sure. Um, he's because he had said at the end of the letter after his, um, you know, his initial finding was more. Um, he's willing to look at it at a more more individualized approach so you would be a great person to help provide some of that information okay well if there's no further discussion jennifer could you call the vote please yes uh phil yes Chunglo. yes nevin smith yes Muscovitz. yes stanley yes thank you all right well, thanks, Paul, for coming. And uh, Dr. McKenzie, did you want to give a quick update uh, on COVID-19? Um, sure, I'm happy to. Thank you so much. And Joyce, was there anything in particular that you think that uh, community members would want to know about? There's certainly a whole lot going on, so I want to make sure that I talk about what is most important to, to, for people to hear about right now. Well, as, as, I, as I know, working in the field that I do, I know that 
you know, the COVID cases and things um, are on a rise basically to the south of us more than anywhere within our area. Yes, we are having some, um, but just giving an update on um, our kids are in school basically yeah. sure. every day. Yeah. They'll, yeah. They'll, so, they'll yeah. Just, just general how the school's operating, where we are in yeah. terms of the metrics established for our instructional model and what we've seen in terms of case count. Yes. So yeah. we opened schools, which I really, uh, I want to thank our town, our faculty and our staff, our principals and our parents. This would not be possible if parents were not cooperating with us and um, being incredibly responsible and vigilant in terms of picking up student, their children, when their children exhibit any sort of symptom and um, keeping sick children home. So thank you parents for doing your part. We, our staff reported back to work the first day they were obligated to on August 27th, 100% of our staff reported to work. On September 16th, we opened the doors to 50% of our student population were eligible to return to school on the first day of school. Um, that included a whole range of students that were considered special populations or certain, certain circumstances. That really made us unique. I would say to you right now that right now today, all the towns that border us, I don't think any of them are open. Correct. Um, and uh, then beginning on October 26th, roughly six weeks into the school year, 100% of students are eligible to attend school five days a week. We do dismiss two hours early every day. We did that by design, particularly when we were creating the plan initially. We know a lot more now, right? All of us know a lot more, but we were very concerned about lunch. Uh, that would require students to remove masks, eating. We were worried about lunch. Uh, so we do lunches, grab and go. And also we were very worried at the elementary school about what we call specials, music, art, and physical education. There's very specific guidance about how you can allow children to participate in those activities safely. So those classes are done remotely. And in elementary, the academic day in the morning, two thirds of the day is done face-to-face -face live instruction five days a week. 100% of students are eligible to attend. Currently at the elementary school, about 80% of the student body attends every day. We've had more families indicate that they are looking to return to face-to-face -face instruction. At Hopkins Academy, because one of the components of our plan is having students remain in cohorts, that happens automatically at elementary schools. That means you're not mixing among groups. That happens by grade levels at elementary and classrooms. At high schools, um, students, change classes, they look forward to that. Um, and the model that we have currently is essentially students in middle and high school are learning remotely, but they have the option of physically coming to school. And this is very important for a lot of students to have access to adults, to have structure in their day, to have people right there available, ready to help them. For many students, um, it doesn't work as well because every student is kind of on their headsets, on their computer, in a cohort with a teacher, but it's not live instruction. So it can be difficult to concentrate even with headsets. And um, I'll say it, I say it for the Hopkins kids all the time, uh, high school under COVID and Dr. McKenzie feels like all the work and none of the fun, but we're trying really hard to uh, fix that. We just, um, we wanted to proceed cautiously. I mean, our big goal is that we could just keep moving forward. And again, I'm, I'm so pleased. I know it's not optimal for anybody, for our staff, for our families, but I really, I look around and say, every single day our schools are open and we haven't had to step back. We haven't had to deviate. We've been able to just incrementally move forward so we are looking right now to um, how we can do the schedule at the high school and the middle school that will allow for in-person instruction, like what the elementary students get, instead of just in-person support. Um, and there's a task force at the high school that's running through all kinds of options, how we can do this and still adhere to the mitigation strategies recommended by the CDC and the Department of Public Health. That's about distancing and hand washing and mask wearing and everything else. And, and being careful about movement. At the high school, only about a quarter of the students 
are attending every day for that coming live. The, the majority, three quarters of the students, it's just about opposite of what you see at the elementary, are choosing to do their remote instruction at home. The thresholds that the school committee has established for determining whether or not to move forward uh, into the next phase of, of our plan, or if they were to pause or even consider changing instructional models, they look at two big things, community transmission and school transmission. In order to assess community transmission, the school committee evaluates, which is what I send to you all every week. They look at the average daily incidence rate in Hampshire County, because they want an N of at least 100,000, so they don't focus solely on Hadley where the population is too small. And they also look at testing positivity rate. In order to determine when we would be in the red for average daily incidence rate, they use the Harvard, Harvard Global Health Initiative, which means when you hit 25, uh, an average daily incidence rate per 100,000 of 25 or greater, that would be in the red. What we've seen in Hampshire County over the last, let me go backwards, 1916, 10.4, 5.5, over the last four weeks, we saw an average daily incidence rate of five, and then it uh, increased uh, over 100% to 10.4, increased by 60% to 16, and then increased this last week to 19, so about a 20% increase. So we're, we're seeing increases in Hampshire County. It's not, at, that indicator is not at the red. We are seeing increases. Thankfully though, the rate of increase, as I said, you saw 100%, 60%, 20%. So hopefully that rate continues to slow down. Some of Baker's comments yesterday, I think, I can't remember the last time I listened to him, seem to indicate that that may be the case. We'll see the data come out every Thursday evening. The testing positivity rate, I think at our last meeting was 1.1, I wanna say, just over 1%. The threshold for that is 3%. The school committee would like to see that at 3% or mm -hmm. less. Um, school transmission is a standalone indicator. If we see school transmission, we would close the schools for a period until we could do sufficient contact tracing and make sure that we have any sort of transmission under control and that it's not going to continue. We've seen no evidence of school transmission. School transmission is not synonymous with case count. Since we've been open, we have had one learner who is 100% test positive. This is not information that gets reported uh, in the state report, but we inform families because we know families want to know. Um, and we have had two in-person learners um, test positive, but we have seen no spread as a result of that, which is what the mitigation strategies, mask wearing, distance, hand washing, that's what that's designed to do, right? If, if the point was, as soon as we had a case, we would close down, why, why did we bother to wear a mask to begin with? We all could have just shown up, waited for the first case and gone home, right? The point of all these things is to make sure we don't have spread. What we've seen to date is we've seen no evidence of school transmission. Um, and we've had no positive cases among faculty or staff. So that's where we are. And we're looking forward to a schedule that I keep promising those Hopkins kids, by June, something will make you happy. I just give me six months <laughs> to get it sorted, but hopefully it'll be sooner than that. I, I would certainly like to take this time because of seeing and sharing with you that, yes, we do have COVID patients um, at our local hospital, but not at the extreme that we did have back in the spring. We're not the same as what's running down south of us. Um, so we are fairly well in this, in this area. Um, but I want to applaud our school department in UN and our teachers and everybody else in the school committee for keeping their head on their shoulders and working this through and making sure that our students are able to have in-house learning because I think that's important. But thank you very much. I, I want to thank you personally. I think you've done a great job. So thank you. Thank you. And I really want to say, uh, if the community, if you see a teacher or a faculty staff member, thank them because uh, schools aren't open without educators and no. people were understandably anxious and afraid and just look around. 
It's one of the few places where people are showing up every day. So we have great people in this town and you have a great faculty and staff in the schools. But thank we, you should, we should actually be the model of our school committee and their thought process uh, in our surrounding towns around us. I, I think you are a true model of excellence. So thank you. They are a sane bunch. I appreciate it. Thank you. I just wanted to uh, echo Joyce. Uh, I have uh, two kids that are in person in the elementary school and one in preschool. They've uh, been in person this entire time. Uh, the school committee has been reasonable and rational in their approach to, you know, slowly stepping into this. And I think it's nice to, like you said, be setting the example for at least Western Mass, probably the whole state, um, as far as our approach to this and realizing that, you know, school plays a, a big part in the, uh, the economic productivity of a town in the area. P parents have to go to work, uh, kids have to learn, there's social aspects, so it, it is important. So thanks for all the work on all of it. All right. Any other questions for Dr. McKenzie or Paul? No? All right. Well, thank you very much, both of you. Appreciate it. All right. Uh, Carolyn, do you want to jump on the COVID-19 update while we're on the topic, just to kind of talk about the old testing, what we're looking into? Um, sure. Um, we, are, we were approached by uh, the Board of Health to start um, looking at any other possibilities for, for testing to make it more accessible. And so we've had a unified command meeting and um, some more discussions, gathering more information, um, looking at different funding sources, could, could the CARES Act pay for it? Um, so we're still, uh, I would say, we're just doing our due diligence to see what opportunities might be out there and working alongside the Board of Health. Um, to see if it's something that could be done, um, but we're really still in the exploring stage right now. I, I read some of those proposals as they came through and I think if we can figure out how to do that, it would also then set us up to have potential sites for vaccinations when they're available. So it's important to, to try and follow up on that. Yeah, we're, we're talking frequently about it. We, we also have, um, of course, I work for Mass General Brigham and uh, we are, we will be notified when, when the uh, vaccination is available, uh, especially to this area. Um, so I will be have, I will be able to give updates on that also. Um, the one thing that I think we, we need to keep in mind is that um, there's a new CDC out uh, on the guidelines on uh, quarantining uh, that you don't have to be out 14 days. I think they've limited now down to 10 days. And then on some instances, it's only seven days. So those are some new guidelines I think the Board of Health will have for us to also look at that it's not as a long as process as it was before. I can make sure I have that updated for the next meeting. Okay. It's an ever evolving process. That's for sure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, Joyce, it's, it's seven days for no symptoms. Correct. And 10, 10 days if yeah. you have, if you have a positive, but yeah. then also, but also we're requiring that if somebody lives with somebody that has had a positive, um, they get it tested, they get a negative, and then they have to continue to have like every three days a testing because you don't always have signs and symptoms right away at that initial testing. So the, the testing just doesn't stop initially, but you have to do it again every three days for, I think, a week. Yeah. Did uh, Caroline... Did the Unified Command and Bordell discuss anything about regularly testing our frontline employees? So that has been a part of the discussion that if that were to happen, that we were able to do the testing, we wanted to, we, we questioned that. Would there be an opportunity for um, 
town employees who up for one thing, um, as well as to the frontliners, but also any town employees if they did not live in town, because it's geared for badly. That's yeah. the initial that was the initial proposal. So a lot of questions have come up and a lot of the information has to get researched and then brought back to us. So um We've had a lot of scares, and it's just I was just wondering to make sure that the Unified Command, yourself, and, and Board of Health are discussing these issues. That's all. That's actually all we're talking about at Unified Command right now. And we have, we have made each a week. little bit of progress. We have a certain number of tests on hand. So we have something like uh, we did at the DPW where an employee came down. We have the ability to test the rest of the employees now quickly and get those tests to the hospital versus uh, those employees spending an eight hour day in, in line with 500 other cars in Holyoke somewhere waiting to get tested. So we've, we've that's a, a new development. So right, thank you. if and when that happens, uh, you know, in another town department. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And then it's four days later and, and uh, frontline employees are still working throughout this whole time, so. All right, so let's move on to license renewals. Jennifer, what's this about? It's about renewal time. Okay. <laughs> um, so I attached a list for all of you of all of our licensees that have submitted for renewals. Um, we had two liquor licenses that did not uh, renew for this year. Um, they, One of them I've been in contact with and the other businesses gone dark and I'm not getting any responses from, but at this point, their license will be returned to the town on December 31st because they did not renew by the 30th of November. Um, otherwise, all the other licenses are here. Um, all the paperwork is correct. I would ask that y'all make the, to make the vote conditional upon uh, my final check with town departments to make sure that they're up to date uh, I am doing it a little backwards this time. So I would ask that the vote be conditional upon me checking with PPW and Susan mostly. Um, but other than that, everybody's ready to go. So, so those, David, those two restaurants that didn't sign up, is it, do they still have until the end of December to do that? No, they're no longer, the ABCC requires restaurants to sign um, their renewal notification by November 30th. Okay. And if you don't renew by that date, your license, um, it, it, you have to start over like it's a brand new license. So there's usually a lag in service. This happens pretty commonly um, in other towns. It's never been a thing that's really happened here, but as I understand, other towns have this happen quite often. Um, one of the businesses just, they just said that, you know, during this time, it's just not, working for them to have uh, an alcohol license. And so they're letting it go and they'll hope that in the future they'll be able to get it back. Can you say who it is or not? I, th I, th I think it, yeah, you don't have a problem. It's uh, Hillside Pizza. They, oh. they said that they're doing a really great job with takeout with pizza and they're still operating and everything's going really well with the pizza and the takeout. It's just their wine and malt. They're just not, um, they're just not bringing in enough right now. So, so they're going to still do the pizza. Absolutely. And we should all probably go get some tomorrow for lunch. There we go. Sounds Absolutely. good. <laughs> so when it comes to the 25% uh, reduction that we offered, um, I'm hoping that the Whole Foods Amazon crowd did not take advantage of that. Is that? Um, I, I have to be honest. I can't tell you theirs right off the top of my head. I will say that a very, very, very large portion of the population of businesses did take it. Um, and then a couple of others didn't. Uh, I had one class two dealer that told me that it didn't impact him. So he's paying his full fee and I thank them very much. And, and so, you know, it's just, it was really up to choices, but a lot of places took it. Um, and so, I think it was the right choice, even if we didn't realize it would impact them or not. Um, I don't. I don't know that Amazon needed it, but <laughs> they probably they probably did take it. I can let y'all know that. I can send an email to you tomorrow and let you know for sure. Oh, that's not a big deal. I was just curious. Um, 
All right, so I guess we need a motion to approve this list of licenses, correct? So moved. All right. And just and just for the record, I'll, I'll be bringing back the, the final round. Um, some people didn't sign a piece of paper here or something like that, but you'll, you'll, you, you know I always bring you to at least two rounds in December. So this is just round one. All right, so we got a motion by Joyce and I need a second. All second. Second by Jane. Any further discussion on this? Uh, Jennifer? Roll oh, call vote, Phil? Yes. Chungalo? Yes. Nevin Smith? Yes. Wiskevitz? Yes. Stanley? Yes. Thank you. All right. Uh, let's move on to FY22 budget. The fun stuff. Oh, yeah. So um, what, I'd, what I'd like to talk about is the FY22 budget. And as you, I don't even, really don't have to even preface it, but you know, it is such an unknown of what next year is going to look like. Um, so I, I just wrote down with some of the recommendations and a, and a memo to you that um, you previously have set up all the departments and divided them up into divisions, which is a very sensible thing to do. And I appreciate that. It's, um, it, it really makes a lot of sense. You did, pri you did have a priority schedule in place, DPW is this year, and education is for FY22. I would ultimately like to say that you'd be able to do that to, to really focus on you know needs of a certain of a certain division, and this year it would be the education. What I'm asking is to possibly consider just pausing that priority focus just until we can see where we're going to be at. Um, some of my recommendations would be to to get a chance to look at what that budget's gonna look like from the governor. That should be coming out um, in January. On January 27th, we'll get the governor's budget. Um, we'll have things like the vaccine. We'll have six months of revenue and expenses to see where we're at at six months. And the state will also have some estimates with the state revenue. Um, the cherry sheet will be, able, will be out and be able to provide us with some more information. It's um, it's just very difficult to do that. And David and I talked a lot about it, both definitely in agreement. And um, so that would be just taking a look at all of those factors that, that could impact getting us better numbers to work with. And um, also continuing your, uh, your priority and your goals in the past of not having a two and a half override. Um, turning the $375,000 back to the stabilization fund, um, make every attempt to go back to the free cash policy and the OPEC policy. And um, what I put in here as a recommendation because um, you know there's level service versus level budget. Um, my concern, even in the level service, you're, you're, you are going to see increases because of con contractual agreements and some costs that just go up and you can't control that. Um, even a level service is going to be more difficult to fund. So again, still uncertainty. Um, but to also the other recommendation is to explore ways to enhance public health and to su support the economic, economic security in the community. So um, those are the, th that's kind of what where we're at. And David and I, David and I actually spent several hours um, just going putting in as much information as we could into the budget for next year. Um, but really, it's going to be so dependent on some better numbers. The downside of waiting is that it is going to shorten the period of getting the budget together. So, um, you know, I would make sure that uh, when we get that information out to the department heads to submit their budgets, that we'll do the best to support them, but it's going to be a, probably a short, shortened time frame. So that's for the operating budget and some of the policy and, uh, you know, keeping in line, putting that money away for free cash and for OPEM. Um, I did attach the um, annual town meeting warrant just because there are some important articles in there that I just, that are going to impact. And I just want to make sure you guys are thinking about it. Um, the first five articles are carried over from the special town meeting um, in November. 
So those are on there. Um, but with the Route 9 widening project, as you're aware, there are there's going to be some water and sewer lines that need to be replaced. So um, it's about $562,000 for the water lines and about $110,000 for sewer lines. So we're going to pursue grants for that. Mass Works is one option, um, but we need to authorize we need author authorization to borrow um, if those grants don't come through. And that authorization to borrow needs to happen at the annual town meeting. So that is um, that is in the warrant. Uh, we will know in August, we'll apply in August, August for Mass Works and any other grant that could be possible to pay for that. But um, we need to, there has to be a funding source committed by September 21st. Uh, if, if we do get those grants, that vote at this fall special town meeting can be rescinded on borrowing, but we just need to have that in there um, just in case. The reason why it's so important, and I know I'm sure David's talked about it in the past, um, to be able to take advantage of the work that's being done for these very old, my understanding, some of these um, these lines are 100 years old, um, huge significant savings to, to work alongside this project. And then the other one is um, uh, Article 20. Um, I think it's been brought up before that FEMA is mandating an update in the flood zone and for the maps. And it's gonna be a lot of work on planning's part, um, but we um, we need to, to just make sure that that article gets put forth at the annual town meeting and be voted on. So those are the, just the two articles that I want to refer to for the uh, annual town meeting. Any questions? So, so would this be the time that we should probably mention that uh, the planning board, Bill Dwyer, is going to be having a meeting next Tuesday um, on the 8th to discuss the uh, living rental agreements or borrowing from a trust uh, to alleviate some of the offset some of the rental. Um, one of the to offset the. Uh, article that did not go on in, in November. Um, they're looking at the trust of uh, Barry Roberts for the uh, East Street Common uh, to provide some type of relief for uh, housing. So I, I just think people ought to be aware that they we will be discussing that next Tuesday uh, to see if that can be tapped into also. Have have the two programs from the state been exhausted for the people for the renters that need it? Christian, yeah. you brought it up and you said there was two programs through the state and there was nobody applying for this rental uh, money in the first place. The two programs I think might be the one for small businesses and then there's the one for the rental assistance. Those are two programs through the CARES Act. Mm -hmm. So has anybody applied for them and used the, those two programs or not? Well, the, nobody's applied for the rental assistance one because we haven't funded it yet. But Jen, I think at the beginning of the meeting, they were saying that not many small businesses have applied for that. But that's two different things. Yeah. And I know the small business one is tricky because you have to have a certain income level. Yep, there's, um, there's a threshold on it. I looked at Yeah. It. And so it's really hard. I mean, it, that, it was pretty low. So to be a business owner and have that, that level of income. More, that's more, more and more I'm looking into this and we're going to take a hundred thousand dollars of taxpayers money to pay somebody's rent. And we're not helping our seniors and we've got senior work off programs and the taxpayers are paying someone else's rent. Well, this is the point I'm trying to make. To, to be clear, though, this we're not talking next Tuesday about the hundred thousand dollars of CPA money. We're talking about just funds that are in the affordable housing trust only. So we're, we're not dealing with CPA until spring. Exactly. Right. But if there's other programs and nobody applies for them, then why do we need to put a hundred thousand dollars on the side? 
I don't know how we would know, John, that somebody has applied. I think um, Angela Matusko had brought it out in one of her comments that there were these two programs for rental assistance. I don't know how we would have access to that to know if people had applied to these programs. I'm not sure if we're privy to that or not. I don't know. Can you look into that, Caroline? I, I know you're pretty busy, but it, it's if we don't have all the information, uh, you know, uh, I, I'm I'm not going to vote for paying for somebody's rent out of tax money. You know. Well, I, I think, uh, and Bill can probably speak to this uh, better than I can, as far as next Tuesday, what the plan is and what we're, you know, I, yeah. I guess we're asking next town Tuesday council. It really doesn't have anything to do with the town meeting uh, lineup. Yeah. Next Tuesday is separate from town meeting. Yes, exactly. Yep. That's absolutely correct. As a member of the Affordable Housing Trust Fund Board of Directors, I did take the initiative to schedule a uh, an organizational meeting for the board of directors we have not met yet <clears throat> i believe that the um, board consists of the five planning board members and david phil and christian mm -hmm. so uh the agenda the first item of business is to organize the board uh chair, clerk, the like. Um, and then the next topic is to discuss the goals and objectives. And one of the possibilities is putting some of the money towards rental assistance. And I'm sure we're not going to be talking about a full $100,000 as was discussed with CPA. Um, but we don't have to, we can meet on a re relatively um, frequent basis if we need to. Uh, so we'd probably, the motion on the floor would probably be to earmark $25,000 towards rental assistance and then see what the demand is. Mm -hmm. But this is, uh, this will come out of funds that are, um, not otherwise earmarked in uh, the affordable housing trust fund. Uh, it's basically the money that comes out of the payment in lieu of building affordable units that Barry Roberts negotiated. So, um, so there, there's money there. It is not taxpayer money. It uh, doesn't come off the tax rate. Uh, that doesn't mean we can sprinkle it around. Uh, no, but, I understand that, but that's the point I'm trying to make, though. That Barry Roberts money is is like a free account that that we could tap if we needed it for something like that, not the taxpayers' money, which we're having trouble with paying our bills right now through taxation. You know, we're trying to keep everybody where they're at or or close to affordable rent, uh, affordable taxes in Hadley. You know. So I, I do want to, to add that there there've already been a question raised about whether it is within the scope of the Affordable Housing Trust Fund <clears throat> to enter into a rent supplement program. And I did ask through, um, through Carolyn's office uh, if that could be referred to town council for a quick turnaround as to whether we even have the authority to enter into such a program. And hopefully by next Tuesday, uh, we will be able to get a um, some basic guideline back about whether it's even a possibility. Sounds good. All right, sounds good. Susan had something? I just have a question. Um, are we are do we have a set of guidelines uh, under what someone would qualify for uh, any kind of rest, rental assistance? Christian, I think uh, isn't there a whole bunch of <laughs> you're gonna hit me up with details that I don't know off the top of my head. I mean the same thing. I don't know what the 
what the details of the, uh, the whole thing are, but I'm sure it has to do with income level, number of people in the household. There is a whole set of criteria. I just don't know that off the top of my head, but it is tied to all okay. income level and that kind of thing. And we were trying to get, I, I think, um, it was rent, it was renters, it was owners, it was special needs, it was income. I don't know. I understand that, but it, but it needs to be someone who is impacted by COVID uh, mm -hmm. um, that this, uh, you know, that this relief comes to, uh, not just everybody who rents applies, you know? My, yeah. my understanding from uh, Dylan Manns was that uh, the restrictions are actually pretty, pretty strict and pretty, you know, it's a high bar to meet to be eligible for the program. Uh, okay. I, I don't know what the requirements were off the top of my head, but from what he was saying, it's um, there's a lot of qualifications that have to be met to be eligible. Okay, thanks. Okay. And uh, anything more on the budget? Do we need to do anything with that, Carolyn, at this point? I, I'm not sure what you've done in the past, if you have voted on those goals or just taking them as recommendations. I, I would like to pause the priority, you know, priority budgeting, I guess, for, for the different departments that we were going through the rotation, at least until we know what's going to happen doing DPW this year, schools were next. But I think until we know what our revenue is going to be coming in, it's going to be tough to even know. Uh, what the governor, the uh, legislature passed the, the budget. So, you know, that part, the cherry sheets and all that should be okay. Um, I don't know about any extras coming from the state or federal at this point, but, you know, I think you're right, Caroline, and until we get a little further down the road here, it may only be a month or two uh, to see exactly what, where we're at. We, we, we know where our revenue's at I'm, for the most part. So. I would just think that, uh, you know, I, I will still advocate for having a planner, um, possibly putting that in the budget this year, because I think with all the things happening right now, um, especially if we're losing Jenny or different funds are free from employees leaving, maybe we could prioritize um, services in the town. And I think having a planner be a member of our staff would be really good for all these grant applications. Um, all the different planning needs we have. I mean, even talking about this driveway issue, having somebody we could consult with that's on staff would be would be great. And if we could find money to do that, I think it would be a, have a good return on investment. Um, so that's one one point. And then just another point that I didn't see on there was just our water and sewer enterprise funds and what our goals will be to shore up those accounts because we, you know, I think revenue was down there some, I know there's some increased regulatory pressure on those departments and I haven't seen any real summaries of those financials in a little bit, but I know from in the past they, they needed help. I know we had a drought over the summer, so revenue is going to be down because people can't use you know, we're not getting that those bonus dollars when people are watering their lawns and they're paying for sewer as well. Um, so, so those are two points um, just that I would like to see in the plan. Um, but, um, you know, I do understand where we are budget wise and those kind of things. Um, so we have to be smart about it. Yeah, I water is still in pretty good shape, but sewer is even in worse shape than it was last year because of the water ban and the hotels not being occupied so yeah the flow's been down so um well i think all of these things are on hold for right now until we get through the next two or three months just to see where we are with exactly with covid and um seeing where the vaccine is going to come from i think that plays a big factor and whether or not everybody is going to be able to get you know vaccinated by springtime or the beginning of may or june 
um, where that would open up our economy and things of that nature. I think um, that plays a big factor in um, a lot of our decisions on what we're going to do. Yeah, if, if I had to make a decision right now, I would absolutely go with level funding immediately. But if we wait a month or two down the road and, and we see something different happening, you know, yep. then we can work from there. Yeah. I don't want to make any rash decisions at this point, but take it all under consideration. So just for clarification, um, level services or level funding, level services, will there will be an increase level, level funding, funding. Will be making cuts level funding i'm saying and i've said it right along well i'm not i'm not willing to do any cutting at this point like i said i think we need to sit back a little bit here and wait and see where we are in a couple of months and you know think about level funding at this point um I don't want to change what we have. We can't afford to decrease any of our departments. But, you know, again, I think not. We, we can't afford to make any rash decisions at this point. So I think in another couple of months, let's see where we are. If, uh, Carolyn, when you're working with David on this, if you could do kind of a parallel track of level service um, and yeah. level funding. I was just going to suggest that like you can see the difference and then we can see the difference in what we can offer the residents and what it's going to cost to offer those things. And then we can make those decisions based on the data. So. Uh -huh. Absolutely. Yeah. I would be more in the mindset of trying to do level services so that we can maintain our staff levels, because if we do level funding, somebody's going to lose their job or some services are going to have to go away. So, um, you know, level service to me would be our, would be my goal right now. But, you know, again, we don't know the future, so we might have. Yeah. To and, uh, and always keep in mind when, when you do level funding and you lay off people as a two to one. So, you know, that's the cost of the town for unemployment. So you actually don't lose anything. You actually pay out more. So if you can keep things in place for what they are, you work out it works out better fiscally than uh, having any layoffs. So I think, you know, again, just let us all wait and, and play this out for another couple of months and see what's going to happen. And I'm, I'm sure everybody knows, but any contractual things that we've got coming up, the employees are going to have to understand that we're in a real financial time period and we don't know how long it's going to be for. Well, Again, be thankful we have jobs and we can keep that. We don't want any layoffs. So, again, let's just all sit tight for a little bit. Okay. Anything else on that, Carolyn, before we move on? Nope. Good. Right. So this next one, we actually have some good news from MassDOT. And uh, this just came in today, actually. Um, Yay. So the letter that's attached, I, I think we do need to uh, update them about the fact that the fence and the bushes have been removed from Russell School. They must have been looking at a uh, Google Maps image or just haven't been this way in a long time because they think the fence is still in place. But they have said they can remove the no turn on red going southbound on Middle Street. So turning, uh, heading south, turning onto Route 9, you'll be able to make that turn on red now. Uh, northbound from Middle Street uh, heading toward Amherst on Route 9, they said they want the fence gone and bushes that are already gone. So we just need to <laughs> clarify, clarify with uh, MassDOT and let them know that that has already been done. But um, the only, in the, the only meantime... Question, the only question I had was a turning radius that they had off of Route 9 for the trucks. Because those two, they said they're not going to take the no turn on red signs off of Route 9. And to me, it's more important to get the traffic off of Route 9 than it is to turn Middle Street into Route 9 in both directions, east and west. I don't know how they're surveying this, but I've been, I've been sitting at those, all four of those red lights at different times of the day. And in the morning, it really aggravates me because I'm on my way to work and I could take a right in front of the town hall in front of Russell School and I've got a red light. But 
that's another issue anyway. Well, we'll, we'll take this small win, I guess, uh, that we've been what right. fighting this for five or six years now since they redid the intersection. So, um, we'll, we'll work on the other, the northbound sign on, uh, on middle street as well. And, uh, well, and then we're going to take the northbound down also, uh, as long as that line of sight was removed, so. Right, yeah, it, as long as the bushes were gone and the yeah. fence, which they knew it is, so. Um, all right, so we'll get that done as soon as we can. And then, uh, Carolyn, do you wanna kind of update everybody on the other, uh, I guess, concessions <laughs> that they made to the town as far as the Route 9 project? Yeah, I have to pull up that letter. Um... Yeah, I seen a picture. It is three lanes on East Street. So, right. I think I sent all of you that in an email. Did you get that? Yeah, I just seen it in an email. Yeah, I can I can talk about it real quick if you, if you uh, want, Carolyn. I just gotta pull it up real quick. Okay. Well, Carolyn, uh, one more question on the water and sewer uh, grants is. Chris, uh, Chris, getting some grants written, written, or is he applying to the state through the SRF fund? Or they did put some extra money in the SRF money for uh, low or no percent loan through water. Mm -hmm. So I am meeting with Chris actually tomorrow to talk about some projects, and that's going to be one of the discussions. Okay, I'll get an update on it. Dave, you still want to go over more of that information? Yeah. The letter? To talk about it or do you have it? I'm pulling it up now. Okay. I apologize. That's okay. No, it's uh it's attached in board docs, it looks like the, the email is so oh okay. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. I don't know. Do you want to just start reading the response yeah. that he got? So basically, the um, one of the main concerns uh, brought up was the intersection of East Street and Route 9. I think they had something like five lanes uh, from East Street onto Route 9, something crazy like that. They've reduced that now down to three lanes, which makes much more sense than what they had before. Um, which means that the property owners in the area will lose a lot less of their lawn space um, and it won't just be a you know concrete jungle type of, type of situation. They've also um, said that they're open to looking at other options for bus stops instead of the glass and um, steel bus stops that you'd see more of the city style. Um, they are willing to consider other options. Uh, they kind of put the onus on us to, to find an appearance that would be acceptable to us. Um, and they said, if we couldn't find anything that was more, I guess, uh, historic looking, uh, they would be willing to consider just, um, you know, doing a bench like they have in, in front of the post office now. So this, this is part of the historic district still. So it, it goes a long way to help, you know, preserve that look versus the city style bus stops. Um, what else? They did not listen to us about our request to do some of the work at night. They basically said it is what it is. <laughs> so no, uh, no progress there. And then what, what was, uh, there's been some other action as well. I know they reached out to the tree committee about five uh, large trees that are gonna need to be removed. I think in front of the, uh, the Legion, there's one and there's some other large trees. So uh, there's gonna have to be some, some conversation about that. I know the Conservation Commission has some issues uh, as well with the plans and the impact to some of the streams or, or drainage areas that are along Route 9. So there's still a lot of work to be done, but at least we made a little bit of progress here with this. Did I miss anything there at all? No, I'm looking at it right now. I don't think so. And, I, and I, they did not address the cost. 
I think they made it clear in that in the last meeting that they weren't going to address this shoveling. Yeah. No shoveling. <laughs> so uh, along those lines, uh, you, since you brought up the shoveling, I'll, mm -hmm. I'll take this opportunity to make half the town angry and half the town happy right now. Um, I'd like us to confirm our policy we've had in the past of um, leaving the sidewalks on Route 9 other than around the schools and the town center. Uh, so that way the, not, the residents aren't having to shovel those sidewalks themselves and the town's not having to pay for those, uh, especially now when we don't have the, the, the money and the manning to uh, you know, do this additional work that DOT should be doing. I'd like to keep, keep what we have. So moved. I'll second that and then I have discussion. Second by Jane, motion by Joyce and go ahead with the discussion. Um, I'm really concerned from what we've seen in the past about the intersections on Route 9 and Middle Street and access for handicapped accessibility. People in wheelchairs trying to get off and on bus. We have people in Golden Court who come down to that intersection often. Um, we do have some people, senior center, who do use public transportation and they would be getting off the bus. And I know the town is busy with its plowing, but I think we have to give extra attention to that, those corners because that's the center of our town and we need it to look like it's clean. Yeah, that that was the motion, Jane, to keep the center of town cleared. I'm just reinforcing that that it's important. Yeah, I well, think we, what we, were we doing said from West Street to East Street, right? Last year, I'm pretty sure. Mm, no, I don't think we did all the way to East Street. I thought it was basically from Town Hall down to Cumberland's because of the students that were walking there along, you know, coming in and out of school in the courthouse pedestrian well, traffic and you then you need to go to west street on both sides because you need to plow both sides of west street anyway so you're going that way anyway through that particular section okay and then also from i think what we were doing was from basically from um the bike path to the center of town if john is that correct basically in front of the library senior center that area well, we went all the way to the elementary school up Middle Street. Okay, yeah, well, that makes sense then. The kids walk to school, you know. The only, I, I wasn't sure whether we did to East Street or not because we had a couple of written complaints and I know I had a couple of phone calls. Uh, people do walk around the block that way from uh, Berkeley, East Street Commons and some of the residents on East Street. Uh, on I, I, think, I, I think our center of town belongs from East Street to West Street. And right. I think I think that's what we should be in charge of. Okay, that sounds fair. East Street to West Street, and basically Town Hall to the elementary school. That's Correct. East. How far down Middle Street do you go? Do you go to Bay Road? No, no, just um, basically right in front of Town Hall. Okay, you're going to start there. No, they go they go to Bay Road, yeah, Bay Road uh, yeah. Middle Street because uh, we come from the highway garage with the machines. So. Oh yeah, you're you're correct we because that that's, that's a town sidewalk. Yep, you're right. That's a town sidewalk on the town hall side all the way up, and then there's a sidewalk on Middle Street only halfway down Middle Street on the other side. Yeah, so you're correct. Somewhere around Sue's house. This was. Uh, if I remember, we just decided we didn't want to be doing what Mass DOT should be doing we, we yeah. still want to take care of our sidewalks just not their sidewalks it, it was Correct. just it was overabundance for the way they were plowing route nine from west street to the bridge and from east street to basically the bike path i think it ends by somewhere around spruce hill all right so motion in a second any other discussion on this all right, Jennifer. Hill? Yes. Chungalo? Yes. Nevin Smith? Yes. Muscavitz? Yes. And Stanley? Yes. Thank you. 
All right, I blame Caroline for opening that can of worms. Um, all right, anything else on Route 9 before we move on? Okay. Um, let's go down to Library Fire Station Senior Center. Who wants to go first? Senior Center is good. Right. North, Hadley, North Hadley Fire Station is good. We um, are holding training sessions there on the weekend, uh, of course, using COVID uh, precautions. So everything is good. It's a regional meeting that they use there on the weekend, I believe on a Sunday. Um, everything is going well. Library is uh, moving in. Um, it sounds like a lot of the good wind is cleared out. Um, you know, they're just kind of doing some final cleanup right now over there. There is some excess furniture and things like that there that might have to go up for auction or something along those lines or get just disposed of. Um, so that's going well. Um, there sounds like there was a bit of a meeting there today where some stuff went well, some stuff, uh, came up for questioning. Seems like a lot of the issues inside the building are solved. Um, I think there was a question about some of the uh, um, fire strobe visibility, um, but there's a plan to fix that. Um, but outside, it sounds like there are a couple issues with the paving, which look like they're going to be addressed, but I think it's probably tricky to just have two different paved paving areas get stitched together. And then I, John might be able to tell us more because um, I, it sounded like there was some dispute over a tie-in, I'm guessing of the stormwater system, um, but I don't really know what that was. And it just happened today. So I haven't really heard from the PM. I didn't get the full story on it yet, but if that just happened today, some yeah. of the maps that they did are are a little bit a uh, little bit discouraging. Uh, the main lap joints between the senior center and the library came out good. I did take a ride through there myself and take a look at it. The elevations on the curbs are terrible, I, and I don't think they're going to do anything for us for that. But uh, they range from four inches up to eight inches where the berm is going around the granite where the parking lot was. The paving company fixed as much as they could, but they just weren't placed at the right elevations. Okay. Yeah, I think that's everything I had from, from that. Hey, but Christian, I have a request and I don't know if this is possible, but um, a couple of people noticed that at night, all the lights in the library are left on. Um, and I know they're all LED and low energy, but is there a way that we could turn off some of that except for what needs to be on for security? Just some people have said it looks like it's, you know, lit up like it's the middle of business hours. Yeah, I've noticed that too. And I thought that during construction they were on, so I can double check and see, um, you know, when we're going to control those lights. I, I, I don't know what the, the deal is right now, but I can ask. Okay, thanks. Anything else on library, fire station, senior center, anything? No, but you, you didn't have anything on there about um, lazy on. And I just wanted to um, make sure that, you know, I have been in contact with, uh, with Mike uh, Mason and our chief. And so some of the things that they're concerned about, which they're just filtering through right now is the 120 page long, reform bill that came in about police. Um, and that's a new thing on the agenda for them. So um, there go there's going to be more to come. Um, of course, Chief said to me, Does it, hey, are you taking my resignation? And I said, oh, no, absolutely not. Um, so we're going to be working through this reform bill um, that was passed by legislature and uh, so more of that to come uh, eventually. So just wanted you to be aware of that. Yeah, uh, I want to compliment the chief on what a good job he did on the grant applications and the money he had brought to his department. 
And yeah. uh, a lot of the stuff in the <laughs> legislation passed, uh, most of the police chiefs and the police departments all agreed on most of it anyway. There was some, most of their recommendations that they voted on. So I think they're pretty happy with the results. Okay. Um, anybody, any other liaison updates before we move on to announcements? Anybody else want to uh, mention anything that's going on in their departments? I, I will just say the library is is open for pickup. So if anybody does want a book, you call in and can you know place an order for a book, and they're providing service out of the new library right now. So just to to make note of that. Thank you. I'll say for DPW, we're way behind on everything because we had got shut down several times this year <laughs> for COVID. Um, but uh, my understanding is the uh, pothole paving crew will be going around um, either later this week or next week again to do some final pothole repairs with the, the hot box before uh, you know, we start plowing snow probably, so. Anything from our Board of Health tonight at all? Doesn't look like they're here. Yeah. Okay, thank you. All right, last call before we move on to announcements. Joyce, you had some condolences? Um, I do have two condolences. One is to Diane Klemick Witkus. Um, her, the only surviving sister is uh, Elaine, um, Goodhine, who come at Goodhine. She used to be our best, uh, not basketball soccer coach in Hadley, but again, um, Diane was born and raised here, pediatric nurse. Uh, and, um, so, you know, our, certainly our condolences to Elaine and her family on Diane's passing. And then Lee Shumway, who has passed last week. Um, he certainly did uh, fight the battle for ALS. Um, so our certainly our sincere condolences to Diane and her girls and family. Um, they certainly had brought quite the awareness to our town on ALS. Uh, we were going to do last year before COVID hit, we were going to do a um, ice bucket challenge for, for Lee and the ALS Foundation. I would like to put out that challenge again, um, how things are in the spring. I would like us as a select board to take that into consideration that we might do that for ALS in the spring as part of our condolences to the, uh, to Lee and his family. Yeah, I think uh, our plan was to do it on the uh, front lawn of town hall with a, uh, a bucket loader full of ice water over the top of us. So I'm just yeah. I'm still in for that if the rest of the board is in for it. I would be more than happy to. And I think that would be uh, a good thing for us to do for Lee and his family. And Jennifer's laughing because she just wants to be the one that pulls the lever and dumps the water. <laughs> <laughs> it's all I want for Christmas. <laughs> you, Joyce, I figured you'd want buckets. So you could whack me with one. No, well, Jeff, you got to stand in front of them. Hey, John, you know, over over my several years, I've been in a dunk tank. I've been all kinds of places, so no problem. <laughs> little ice water over me won't kill me, I don't think. So I'll go for it anyway. All right. So any other announcements? Yeah. All right. Our next meeting is December 16th, which I believe will be the last one of this of 2020. Yeah, it is. So we'll see you on December 16th. And if I could get a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Second by Christian and Jennifer, roll call. Hill. Yes. Chunglo. Yes. Nevin Smith. You're She's muted. nodding. I take that as an affirmative. Wiskevitz. Yes. <laughs> and Stanley. Yes. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Stay safe.